So hello, everybody. This is the CUDA and Open Lab seminar on February 28th, 2022, uh, which is a special one uh, for several reasons. Uh, it's not a lecture, it's a lab encounter, which, as you know, uh, we have instituted a couple of semesters ago. And we do this more rarely, but this is a sort of an end-to-end -end meeting where uh, basically the Cultural Data Analytics Research Group at Tallinn University, funding through the European Commission, meets other labs, which we um, sort of are inspired by, which we want to learn from, um, and uh, which we think um, are outstanding examples. In this very particular case, um, this is especially true. Um, so today, um, I uh, sort of contacted Ciro Catuto and Yarmi Moreno, uh, at the Institute for Scientific Interchange in Torino um, to initiate a, a, an encounter with a bunch of people uh, at the Institute for Scientific Interchange in us. And so this is very special for uh, sort of three reasons. One is that um, the Institute for Scientific Interchange is a very special institution that engages in what's called true multidisciplinarity. I had funding proposals and the book rejected due to that word, um, because it was uh, too multidisciplinary. So there's very few places where this is fully lived out. And um, the Institute for Scientific Interchange is one such place. And not only does it happen there in sort of like, you know, you could say basic fundamental research, but they do fundamental research and applied research and includes um, basically the full spectrum from sociocultural on one end uh, and art on one end to computational physics on the very other end, often in a combination, in a sort of lab of labs uh, manner. And um, that thing is incredibly fruitful and incredibly inspiring by itself, but also it has a sort of philosophical mission, uh, which you'll often hear for social good, data science for social good, machine learning for social good, uh, driven by institutional philanthropy uh, with the aim of sort of like benefiting Europe and so on. So this is deeply, deeply inspiring. Then point number two is has to do with how Kudan came to be. So Kudan, uh, the group for cultural data analytics, is a twofold sort of initiative. On the one hand, the Tallinn University reached out to the European Commission, the so-called ERA uh, chair funding program, um, that they want to sort of institute uh, a cross-school collaboration, Baltic Film Media and Art School, School of Humanities, School of Digital Technologies, to actually institute and uh, build a novel approach of cultural data analytics, obviously in line with what cultural analysis is doing on a broader world scale. Um, and they were looking in that circumstance, once they got the funding, for somebody who would be that shareholder. And I applied for that position. But I didn't apply out of nowhere. I applied with a vision, and that vision uh, only exists because um, I sort of tried to uh, get ERC funding, a consolidator grant, which was violently rejected, as all true multidisciplinary stuff seems to be in that case. Um, and that thing was possible to develop because uh, the Institute for Scientific Interchange um signaled readiness to act as a host institution and actually supported uh, sort of how uh, this um, vision came to be and um sort of in some sense what what we have built at Tallinn university right now the hiring strategy of hiring from cultural semiotics cultural history on one end all the way to uh, machine learning and physics on the other end is sort of a, a brainchild of that uh, sort of openness of uh, the Institute of Scientific Interchange. So I'm very grateful for having allowed me to engage in writing this funding proposal uh, and sort of had, having had a sparring partner in that uh, circumstance. So this is one of the nodes in Europe, which not many people may be aware, where something like, uh, you know, sort of the whole Max Planck Society happens in the tiny little box taken together and people actually talk to each other and not sit in uh, different cities. So that is really cool. Um, and then there's another third reason why I think this is actually a rather fitting thing today, which is um, in 2019, I have been um, 
I had the pleasure to teach um, at the uh, International Summer School for uh, Computational Social Science in Berlin, which was organized by um, um, people from GESIS in, in Germany with a lot of Italian participation. And uh, among the 40 postdocs in that crowd, there was one who had to leave a day early uh, with their partner, uh, both of them postdocs in the area of computational social science, because the Zelensky government was freshly elected in Ukraine, and they were actually joining the party members um, for a sort of, um, one could say, crash course in what it needs uh, and what it entails to be sort of a 21st century scientist, in particular dealing with society, meaning computational social science. So uh, what we're seeing right now, the resilience of what's going on is in part uh, a resilience which comes out of um, this kind of academic environment where um, basically radical multidisciplinarity sort of works for the social good. This is a really, really interesting, inspiring thing that uh, moves me since then, because I've never met any other political party that actually did something like that um, as sort of like the thing between being elected and moving into parliament. And uh, so today you're gonna hear a whole bunch of uh, examples of things that either are sociocultural data analysis or are things that may be relevant for us because uh, the methods can be applied to what we're doing. I know that you did a lot of sociocultural stuff. Um, you did a lot of epidemic stuff. Uh, you did a lot of other things that are uh, super relevant for what's going on in the world right now. And we're super excited to have you here. And so what I could do is I could introduce Yamir Moreno and Chiro Katuto. Uh, but I don't, because there's many other people in this audience, which I already have seen, uh, who are just equally as awesome. And uh, I just um, encourage everybody, uh, go to the participant list, uh, when whoever speaks up, uh, Google them, stand back in awe. Uh, this is not something that is only related to um, whatever EASY is doing and what, um, what computation social science is doing and stuff like that. Yammer, for example, has been the president of Network Science Society and um, of uh, Complex System Society. And so this is, this, this is like the large as multidisciplinary as it gets. So I give over sort of the staff to uh, one of you. So we have a two hour time slot until uh, 4 p.m. And we can use it however you like. So you can talk a lot, uh, you can talk very little and we can discuss a lot. Uh, you can decide to uh, let's sort of like, you know, give pitches and discuss while you're talking, or you could say, oh, I want to speak for 10 minutes and then we can have questions or something like that. So thank you very much for, for being our guest today. Thank you, Max. And we are, we are also very honored and pleased to be, to be part of this. Uh, I am Chirga Tudor. Hello, everybody. Uh, we shared, I think, an agenda with, uh, with the list of speakers uh, and tentative mm -hmm. times. Uh, we will try to proceed according to that. Uh, I anticipate that like several of us had very little time to prepare, so we might go a little longer, but we'll try to keep it within, you know, like 50 minutes, uh, all in all to give as much space as possible to, to the discussion. And uh, of course, it's very difficult to speak about the research today with the backdrop of what is happening in Europe, with war in Europe. And I'm aware of where many of you are sitting right now. Uh, at the same time, as Max was saying, uh, the last few years, the COVID crisis uh, included now, have shown that uh, we are very interconnected. We are highly interdependent. And the science that we are speaking about here is really uh, part of the intellectual toolbox that allows us how to figure out how to maybe respond better to crisis. And so although it's very difficult to speak about science here, that's, that's what we do. And uh, I would like also to thank Professor Max uh, Schick for the kind invitation to share some of our uh, experiences uh, here at uh, ISI Foundation to the words of many colleagues uh, uh, who are connected, and uh, I will not go on and introduce all of them. I trust that uh, you know most of them, and if not, they're free, of course, to introduce themselves. And as Max said, uh, it's, it's very nice to think of ISI as a lab of labs, um, and uh, 
all of the people that you will uh, hear from today are senior researchers, so, so they have their own you know, science activities and group and network. And, uh, and the work of uh, uh, people like uh, myself, uh, Professor Ion Moreno, uh, Dr. Francesco Bonchi at ISI, uh, is a really a role of coordination of research. So we will present uh, today slices uh, of the work that we carry out uh, in two areas of research. Um, and, uh, and I hope that through that you will get the sense, uh, uh, not so much of the what, but more of the how, the philosophy, uh, like, like Max was, uh, was saying. So I will just, you know, very quickly share my screen. If, let me see if I can do that. That proves to be always a little bit challenging. So I hope it's working out fine. Right. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. So uh, ISI Foundation, just, just a couple of words. I, I, don't, uh, I don't think we have time uh, to, to present ISI Foundation as a whole. And this is more about, you know, like science and labs meeting as, uh, as, you, as you instructed us to do. Uh, but I think it's important to state a few facts about ISI. ISI is a private research center based in, uh, in Torino, Italy, northwest, near the, the Alps. Uh, it's got a long history. It was founded by Professor Mario Rassetti more than 35 years ago, uh, with funding from several of the regional and, uh, and, and uh, urban uh, funders and stakeholders. It's been supporting throughout the history from one major funder, which is uh, CRT Foundation, which is one of Italy's leading philanthropic institutions. And, uh, and the mission of ISI is, uh, you know, it, ISI is many things, but the mission is to create and disseminate knowledge and possibly at the highest possible level, possibly with a lot of freedom and an eye to intellectual uh, freedom and curiosity driven uh, research, as we like to say. And um, the, because of this, the, we are not so much organized in labs. The, 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 the structure is relatively flat, but there are three main areas of research that you see represented here. Uh, you can probably see this better on the ISI website. So if you have, well, I know you have a computer in front of you, you can just go to www.isi.it and peruse that graphic, which is also a little bit interactive. Um, but basically what, what I want to, to share about this, this, this is something we call the arc of science. So this embraces all we do at, at ISI and it's been evolving over time, which is a feature, not a bug. It's a, it's constant change of the focus and of the mission. And uh, right now we are, we are organized along three areas. Uh, one about data science for social impact and sustainability, which is coordinated by, by myself. Uh, one about mathematics and complex system, which is coordinated by Professor Jeremy Moreno, who's here. And one about machine learning and what today you would call AI, which is coordinated by Dr. Francesco Bonti, who unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, here today. And uh, uh, all of these research areas uh, live in a tension between uh, data-driven approach and the theoretical like uh, vocation and with different balances. Uh, and so uh, in, in this ideal like left to, to right axis, uh, you move from the more data-driven applied research uh, to the right, to the more theoretically inspired uh, and, uh, and curiosity driven uh, research. And different people here uh, lie on different uh, uh, points of this axis. And in a sense we embrace and, and, and the richness of ISI we think is that we embrace this diversity, right? Uh, this diversity of also of motivation for generating knowledge, uh, this diversity of sensibility towards the, the applications. Uh, or not. So we will be speaking, I will be speaking mostly about uh, in the like, six minutes I left about uh, this, uh, uh, the area I coordinate. And uh, without much ado, let me, let me show you like that the area is mostly researchers, right? I mean, uh, institutions are people. So these are the researchers that we pride ourselves in, uh, in having uh, on board. The one with the underlying name are permanent full-time researchers. The others, including myself, are part-time uh, researchers. And, and through the words of these people, you will hear today about uh, the, the science of ISI. So my, my job, in a sense, is done. I would like to just show them, show you uh, who ISI is. And today you will hear from um, 
dottor Gilema Mengiova, dottor Daniela Palotti, uh, dottor Michele Tizzoni e uh, dottor uh, Giovanni Petri, qui in, uh, in, uh, in professor Moreno's area. And uh, uh, it's important to state that I have, you know, like for me, ISI is one of the hats. I have basically three types of hats in academia, in philanthropy, and in the government. And I've been working closely with the government in Italy on the social impact of AI and try, you know, to, in a sense, produce the best outcomes for, for citizens. This is important to mention because basically it allows us to harmonize The, the research component with the funding component with the with the with the social impact component and the policies and, and decisions so without much further ado let's talk about basically the, the three ingredients of, of the other right the, the science the training component isi does not have per se a training uh, mission it's not it's not a you know a university organization but of course we have uh, you know um, students and PhDs, uh, and we do training at different levels because this is how you share uh, knowledge. Um, and I will speak a bit about data collaboration. So in terms of research, uh, the way the area is, is organized uh, is, uh, is basically in such a way that we can create these three-way dialogues uh, between problem owners, uh, nonprofits, global agencies, government, municipalities, uh, Uh, data owners, increasingly, I don't have to tell this audience, right? Data that we need to carry out our, our science are born in, uh, in industrial hands, in private hands. And so understanding how you can tap into this data and extract value from there, which is not the original value, is, uh, is a lot of what we do. No? If you think about computational social science, it's really about using digital traces of human behaviors to answer all the new questions about the social sciences. So uh, we, we try to tackle in a systematic and sustainable way the problem of how to connect uh, data owner, problem owners, and research. And we are, you know, we are in that corner. We are basically enabling with our work some of these dialogues. So our research in this area is by its nature applied, data-driven, co-developed. Normally data already exists. We develop the problems together with the problem owners so that they are relevant. And of course, we have, you know, we have a very broad vision of what data science means. And, uh, you know, by, by now, I'm, I'm very confused about what data science or AI are. Uh, our own vision is basically, you know, a mix of collecting the data, complex system, mathematical modeling, machine learning, network science, computational social science applied to problems that lie in many areas of direct social impact that are shaped on the sustainable development goal agenda of the United Nations. So we focus mostly on population health, humanitarian response, future of cities, and you will hear about some of these problems. We translate this also into partnerships, and we actually rely for executing you know, this vision in partnerships. So it's important to stress what our partners are. We work with the organization that you see there, like UNICEF, IDMC, GovLab, OECD, Work for Program. They are the problem owners. And we have data providers, uh, mostly, as I, as I mentioned, from, from companies. And uh, some of these collaborations are very episodic. Uh, others are more sustained over time. And then we have funders. And the area that I'm speaking about and I coordinate is mostly funded by the historical funder of ISI Foundation, who is uh, CRT Foundation. CRT Foundation is Italy's third largest philanthropy uh, and was chairing the European network of philanthropy until a couple of years back. And as you imagine, then we have SU, uh, European projects and funding and, uh, and a vast partnership network. And finally, training for us is very important. Um, so we also designed uh, on the same triangle, um, training experiences for um, young scholars, young data scientists, uh, who after this experience go into a PhD or maybe in an industrial position, uh, where we place them at the center of a collaboration between uh, a data owner, a problem owner, the organization I mentioned, and, and the science of ISI Foundation. If you want to read more about these projects, you can find a very nice report here. Uh, but uh, to give you a flavor of the projects, I mean, we've been working a lot on the impact on mobility, on, uh, on epidemic spreading, and in general mobility as a proxy to decode social systems. Uh, gender gaps and inequalities, uh, urban safety, food insecurity, uh, abortion accessibility, monitoring on global news, uh, and reusing also in creative new ways 
targeting data from major digital platforms. We, we've been also very active, and here, I mean, when I say we, I mean the people who are in the area, not myself, uh, in creating uh, uh, communities. So we, we really made a point in strategizing the presence of the data for social good uh, events uh, at the World Wide Web Conference, at uh, the International Conference on Web Blogs and Social Media, Applied Machine Learning Day, at the Conference on Complex Systems and Network Science Conference many times over. So really establishing a community uh, that, that bridges the, the different communities of interest and, 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 and creates bridges to the problem owners. And, and with the Secretary General of the CRT Foundation, we also like wrote a sort of manifesto on what we mean, you know, to be a modern philanthropy today and, and, and help with the fund, from the funder perspective, uh, generate this type of value for, for society. We also have a place for this, which is the place where I am sitting, where we have established an umbrella organization called uh, Data Science for Social Good Center. And, and to give you a flavor of what we do, science is one of the things we do. Uh, we just launched, for example, an accelerator. This is for startups with social impact, uh, where, uh, where basically big corporates can invest not funding, but data, reusable data into the success of uh, social impact ventures. So again, trying to, you know, trying to find new ways of using uh, uh, the forces of the market uh, mechanisms in society to generate more value from uh, data, more socialized value, more equitably distributed value of data. So I will stop here. I was long. Sorry for taking two, one, one, two minutes too long. Um, we will proceed as, uh, as shared, but this is just a reminder of what's, uh, of, you know, like of the, what's going to happen. So I'm going to hand it over to Professor Yamir Moreno, who will give an overview of this area. And, uh, and it's important to stress that at ISI, we really have coexisting very different visions of, of of what our job is, and this is, uh, I, I think, a huge part of, of our value. Uh, and then there will be presentations by, by, by senior researchers in both of the areas, and then hopefully we'll have time uh, for what I expect will be a very pleasant discussion. So thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the ride. Thank you very much. Should I, should I go, Max? Yes, Yamir, sorry. I, 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 I said silently Yamir with a switched off microphone. Okay. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let me share my screen. Thank you very much, Ciro, uh, for, for the introduction. You, you save uh, quite some of my time because now I don't need to introduce ISI. It's just to add to what Ciro mentions that ISI is um, 40 years old, or almost 40 years old institute. Um, Perhaps the area that um, have been always there is, is the area that I, I'm going to talk about is the mathematics and, and foundation of complex systems. Uh, of course, the content of the area have changed because we, we adapt to, to the normal evolution of, of, the, of the research field. Um, and for example, at the very beginning, there was quite some activity on, on quantum computation and, and these sort of things now is not anymore at the ISI. Um, we have um, placed it more focus on other problems that we think are now more topical and more important in terms of applications. <clears throat> so essentially I will be talking about um, this part that you see here of, of the Institute. This is the the, the research area and this part uh, includes more or less all this part that is here so with some uh, incursions let's say also in for example topics like uh, computational social science and health and sustainability so <clears throat> um, um, as as you mentioned um, we 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 are sort of flat let's say uh, structure in the sense that we have these big areas that are somehow coordinated by the three of us, but uh, we have a number of senior researchers that are fully independent in choosing uh, problems to, to study. Um, as of today, this is more or less a summary of what subfields or if you want methodologies are being addressed in, in, the, in, the, in the group or in the area. So the first one is mathematical of complex systems, the structure and function of networks. I will explain a little bit more about each of these topics uh, next. 
Then we have uh, traditional computational epidemiology, and more recently uh, also addressing specific aspects of some specific diseases like, for example, COVID-19, but previously also tuberculosis, we, we studied is a very different disease for which you need very detailed and, and sophisticated models uh, um, that are not usually described with um, the simple comparamental model that we are used to. Um, then we, we do, since um, maybe 10 years or, or more or less, a topological data analysis uh, um, and more recently higher order structures, which includes uh, simplicity of complexes and um, higher order or hypergraph, let's say. Um, there is a small part of the area that is really, really theoretical, is really uh, mathematical foundation, um, and it's a theoretical description of um, what we call computation beyond Turing. Um, then there is also a, a few more uh, lines that are of theoretical nature, but also inspired by some examples or applications <coughs> in brain sciences, um, also exploring uh, ways in which machine learning can um, help you know, understanding some complex system by, for example, revealing some constitutive laws that we don't know, and also how network science could help improve current algorithms in machine learning, uh, like deep learning, etc. And then a more recent topic that have been that started actually less than two years ago is is uh, the line that is um, we, we call sustainable and healthy nutrition which is um, rooted in the fact that we were approached by a big group. Um, I think I can disclose the name, it's this Ferrero group, um, that uh, they were very interested in, in applying, in, in, in at least in uh, seeing how these techniques, uh, artificial intelligence, complexity, science, networks, et cetera, could be applied to solve problems uh, in this field of research. Um, this is just a summary of a few names. There are a few that um, maybe one or two that have arrived very recently and I missed there, uh, but this is more or less the members of the groups. I, I fully agree with Shiro is a, an area or, or, or an institute made by, by the researchers. Um, these are those that are right now under our area, plus a few of of other that um, eventually also collaborate with us, but uh, are not, let's say, um, collaborating so intensively as this. Um, in particular, you will hear that Japan is, is our senior research scientist in the area, together with Corrado, um, and they are full-time uh, senior researchers, and, and you will see, uh, you will hear about Japan a few of, of the things that he is doing. Let me, before describing the areas, let me just say a few things about what are our gatekeepers in the sense that what we think is, is our, um, let's say, fingerprint or, or the area. So we, we, we think that the ISI is, is and has been and should be, should continue to be a leader, not a follower. That means that we need to develop um, um, uh, the methodology and the know-how. That means that we, we need to invest in, in a significant part of our activity in doing curiosity-driven and basic science, which allow to develop methods and tools that you will be able to then use to solve practical problems. Otherwise, you become a user and not a developer or, or, or someone that's, uh, you know, propose new ways to look at, at these systems. So that's that's why we when we approach any founder or, or organization, uh, or even when we write a project for European or public funding, uh, we try to secure um, to you know a core funding that allows to meet the, the, the these points and in particular when we talk to industrial partners of course they are welcome we try to also get a fraction of the money that is given to to us to do this sort of curiosity driven blue sky research just don't you know ju just to be able to develop new tools that will allow to continue with the project at other uh, later stage 
Of course, provided that um, we don't lose our scientific independence, I think that this is really, really important. And Shiro was mentioning uh, before that um, ISI has always, you know, um, um, try to develop knowledge and communicate knowledge and train people. And this is really an important aspect of our activity. We should decide, or we, sh we should be free to decide um, where to invest our, our resources, human resources. Of course, uh, in current times, you have some constraints. You cannot do whatever you want uh, at any cost because uh, you also have to provide some uh, feedback and some uh, results to, to our funders. So, the idea is always to have this mix between uh, I solve your problems, provided that you also give me money to um, try to develop further my methodology. So um, going back to the uh, main research line, um, um, I think I, I have highlighted the, the few that I think are, are more um, probably um, uh, intense in the last few years. Um, I think that topological, topological data analysis and hydrogen structures is one of the research lines that is really now being pushed by, by the area. With uh, you, you saw the, the researches there, at least four or five of the researches are devoted to that. So it's uh, an important part of our activity. Um, and these lines, uh, you know, it's uh, research aims at pionary theoretical mathematical works that advance our understanding. Um, of systems that could be described or should be described uh, beyond pi-wise interactions. You know, networks normally, when you study the network, normally you represent the node and the link between the nodes. But uh, we think, um, and, and actually you see that from the data that there are more than that, that uh, normally you can have edge that um, represent interactions between more than two um, objects. So in that sense, um, uh, this is something that we are addressing. I don't. I don't know if Geo will be uh, talking about this, but essentially, this is something that um, Geo has developed. The topological journey. I mean, the, the topological data analysis part and the higher order structures. We are working uh, together in this and uh, collaborated intensively. Um, the other part in which also Giovanni is is um, the senior researcher that is in charge of that part of our area is the theoretical foundation of brain science. Um, and essentially we look for problems that uh, try to you know, unravel the role of higher order fixtures in physiological brain function, um, also other alteration, alterations, and then to develop also computational um, um, methods based on simplicial models to study the topological function of uh, the topological function of the brain. Um, another one that um, it's, uh, well, this is just um, kind of self-promotion. This is the, the, our um, recent uh, nature physics perspective in, in which uh, uh, we kind of lay down what we think is, is, is the, the, the field or, or the state of the art of the field and what are the, the next steps that could be uh, taken. Um, I would like to insist, as, as you see from the list of authors, um, this is a multidisciplinary area. This is something that we also try to, not to only to develop the methodology, but we also try to connect with some applications. You see, for example, Sonia Kefi, she is an ecologist, uh, and you see uh, people here that are more trained in brain um, dynamics and, and brain structure, like Enrico Amico, et cetera. Um, and you see people that are mathematician, Francesco Vaccarino, and people that are physicists and computational scientists, um, um, like Thiago um, and, and the rest, myself, et cetera. Um, the other domain that we are really, really interested because this actually allows interacting with other areas within the Institute is the, the one that explores synergies between machine learning and complex systems. And here the idea is, is very, very simple. It's tied to um, incorporate the learning methods to cover hidden relations between the structure and dynamics of complex systems. And finding, for example, governing and constitutive laws that we, we don't know, and that machine learning techniques could help you to unravel those laws. And on the other hand, also 
to use um, network science, in, for example, to improve or to, to make it, uh, to create more power for artificial neural networks, both in terms of input data requirements and output quality. So trying to understand what we can also bring to, to that area. And finally, um, the sustainable and healthy nutrition, which is the, the, the more apply of our topics uh, uh, in terms of uh, industrial partner, that funds our research. Um, and here the, the, the plan is to um, go the whole spectrum of, of the scales from the agriculture um, and the chemical composition of the foods, the nutrients, etc. how these foods are combined together um, through recipes, uh, daily intakes, uh, cultural inheritance, etc. Um, and that, that will determine how you mix all this raw material together and then go up in the scales also to see how this impacts uh, some uh, health biomarkers at the population levels. This is on the healthy part and the sustainable part is just to try to model um, the many interdependencies that affects uh, this, uh, this system as a complex system, trying to find what are cause and effects relations in this system. So I think this is all that I had. Um, and I would be happy if I, I mean, if, if anyone has questions to answer questions later. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so it, I don't know if it's a good question to a good moment to take one or two questions right now, because we're sort of like going from the more um, institutional part to the more researchy part. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Chiro and, and Yamir. This was, this was, a, I learned a lot also um so there is there's maybe some bridges i should i should take which is um there's a lot of um new concepts in this area like uh, higher order structures uh, simplicial complexes and stuff like that which those who are involved in complex systems those who are involved in computational social science and network science and so on have heard are deeply invested in but they will actually come to sort of the less technical half of um, of um, you know digital humanities um, that work their way into network analysis, they will realize you know they're dissatisfied with only having one link type, and they will learn oh there is now triangles, there's tetraders, and things like that. And so I think what one part of our uh, of our aim is to sort of like make that flow of concepts quicker. And, and actually see how these things can be applied and vice versa in the other direction, have a flow of problems that um, may put uh, you know, useful rocks in the way of things that are just thrown at data in essence. And so I think there's a, there's a really interesting, fruitful kind of thing uh, that we can do. So in that sense, I encourage everyone uh, who encounters a concept in this discussion that you haven't heard, this is a good moment to ask the experts uh, and some of them like for high order networks for example um giovanni petri is is not just an expert he's sort of like is one of the co-founders of this field in a sense um so um I, I don't see any hands raised so maybe we just continue with the with the with the um with the lineup which the next one is michele tizzoni the analysis yep. um uh, you want to uh, spell it out yourself? Maybe you change the title a little bit. So, Michele, I give the stage to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Max. And thanks a lot for the opportunity to, to present. Um, uh, here is my presentation now. I'm sharing my screen. And I think I hope you're going to see it. So, um, I'm going to. Uh, take uh, the next few minutes uh, to give uh, uh, basically an overview of uh, the um, uh, the work that uh, um, we have uh, been doing uh, as a team uh, uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic on analyzing mobile phone data and uh, um, mobility uh, uh, from uh, uh, mobility traces uh, uh, extracted from mobile phone data. Uh, I'm just trying to, oh, sorry, to remove, okay, here the, okay. <clears throat> so, 
uh, as you all uh, probably know very well uh, already, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has shown uh, that mobile phone data can be used to inform uh, different aspects of the public health response by providing a picture of people uh, uh, move uh, and, uh, and about their behavior, and in particular, so uh, they have been instrumental to evaluate the impact uh, of interventions uh, of, of mobility and uh, and social distancing interventions. And and here in the next slides, I will give a, a brief overview of, of different uh, uh, works that uh, uh, we have been doing uh, uh, over the last two years uh, uh, with with colleagues at ISI related to the analysis of mobile phone derived uh, mobility data during the pandemic. Uh, first, uh, uh, in, in early in 2020, we published the uh, perspective with several, uh, many other authors from uh, different institutions who were um, uh, already active uh, in the area of uh, analyzing mobile phone data. And this work has been published in Science Advances, uh, uh, titled Mobile Phone Data for Informing Public Health Actions Across the COVID-19 Pandemic Life Cycle. And this picture, uh, this figure somehow shows uh, uh, what is the, the, the key value of uh, um, uh, using mobile phone data uh, uh, during an event like the pandemic, because basically it allows us to extract different uh, mobility metrics uh, from the uh, trajectory of users that are inferred uh, from their calls. And here we can see uh, the, the, the typical Voronoi tessellation of, uh, of uh, uh, cells, uh, of, uh, of, of tower cells in a, in a mobile phone data set, and then allow to extract uh, um, uh, mobility matrices like in the, uh, in, the, in the panel B, so know how many people move between different locations, uh, A, B, C, D, E, uh, and then also to a higher level of resolution to extract also co-location events, so how people are present at the same time, how many people are present at the same time in the same location, and then infer uh, contacts in a sense, and uh, if available also disaggregate these contacts uh, by age, which is also a very important metric in, uh, um, in, in, uh, in in epidemic models, and finally, also use uh, time uh, use data, infer uh, time use data from uh, the same type of data set, and then infer how much time people spend at home, for instance, which is of course very relevant to understand the effectiveness of uh, um, uh, um, shelter in place uh, um, policies, uh, uh, like the many that were adopted during during the pandemic. Uh, uh, this type of data, we have been working uh, closely uh, on this type of data in the case of Italy uh, since the very beginning of the pandemic uh, in collaboration with a uh, in location intelligence company, uh, which is called Cubic. Uh, and uh, this was our main focus at the beginning of the pandemic. We uh, worked uh, on the real-time analysis of the identified and privacy enhanced mobility data starting from February 21, uh, 2020. And basically with the objective of uh, estimating the effects of, of the restrictions that were put in place in Italy on mobility and, and release publicly the, the aggregated data uh, to inform uh, uh, epidemic modeling efforts. Uh, the fact that we had uh, a previously uh, created partnership with the Data for Good program of Cubic uh, allowed the immediate collaboration with the, with the company and, and data sharing during the emergency. And this has led uh, to the publication that I'm setting here. Uh, the, so we released the, 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 the data basically uh, of, uh, of mobility in Italy during the uh, the first wave of the pandemic, but also uh, we allowed us to public uh, periodic report uh, uh, during the lockdown period, the March, April 2020, that we published uh, uh, on, a, on a website as the, the, the events were, were unfolding, so almost uh, in, in near real time, uh, with this type of analysis. So here I'm just showing as an example uh, different snapshots of Italy and uh, the traffic of people moving out uh, uh, of a province during different weeks of 2020 uh, as the uh, pandemic was at the beginning and then the lockdown was enforced. Uh, and we also got quite uh, high level media coverage for this effort, for instance, uh, an article by the New York Times that were, was based on our data to show the, um, how the lockdown in Italy affected the travel behavior uh, in Italy. Uh, we then also worked on, on European, at the European level, uh, in collaboration with Google and other uh, collaborators at uh, Boston University, Harvard, and the London School of Economics, uh, with the idea of using uh, the Google mobility data 
uh, to estimate the effects of uh, social distancing policies uh, across uh, different European countries uh, and uh, their uh, different impact uh, on the COVID-19 uh, case trajectory during the spring 2020. Uh, so this work was published uh, in PLOS One last year. Uh, and, and basically uh, what we did in this paper was to um, uh, link uh, different uh, uh, policies uh, between mandatory uh, and non-mandatory and quantify the effect of this uh, of uh, early policy adoption of mobility uh, across uh, different countries that we know in Europe uh, uh, had taken different approaches. So we know that uh, some countries implemented uh, earlier the lockdowns, some others didn't uh, implement uh, strict mandatory policies until uh, until later. And uh, our results uh, somehow uh, explain, uh, for instance, a one-to-one -one linear relationship between the decrease in mobility uh, observed through uh, mandatory policies uh, and uh, decrease in, uh, in case growth. Uh, a, a second important aspect we should like to focus in this uh, short presentation that we explored, and I think it's very relevant in terms of also future perspective, uh, is the, 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 the analysis of the social economic determinants uh, on mobility responses. So uh, how much uh, the change in behavior that we observe through, uh, we can measure from mobile phone data is determined uh, by socioeconomic determinants. Um, for instance, we investigated this aspect in this work that, that we published last year on the Journal of the Royal Society Interface, uh, where we analyzed the uh, spatial differences in responses. So the relative change of mobility uh, uh, in different Italian provinces in different periods of the, of, of the pandemic and also uh, at the higher spatial resolution within cities. And here you can see on, on the right, I'm showing a, a map of, of three major Italian cities and their neighborhoods. And there we see there is a lot of heterogeneity in the, how much people change their behavior. So how much uh, people decrease their mobility uh, relative to the pre-pandemic period uh, during the different phases. And uh, much of this uh, uh, spatial differences, much of this heterogeneity can be explained by uh, socioeconomic factors and specific, specifically um, uh, differences in the lo local labor force structure that uh, uh, has been affected differently by uh, different uh, uh, policy measures, but also by uh, demographic factors as such. Uh, older population uh, tended to uh, decrease more their, uh, their mobility um, uh, and, and also uh, uh, income, for instance. In large urban areas also we observed the effect of, of the certification of city centers where basically uh, in all big cities, uh, uh, central areas were most affected by, by the change uh, of mobility, so by decreasing mobility, which persisted after the lift of the lockdown, at least, uh, at least in Italy in our case. Uh, and then uh, another case of this, uh, another example of this type of analysis, we, we conducted a study in Santiago de Chile, uh, this time in collaboration with uh, Telefonica um, and Universidad de Desarrollo, uh, based on, on the analysis of, of of, of uh, XDRs on, on data uh, uh, connections from mobile phone users uh, in uh, uh, anonymized mobile phone users, we uh, uh, estimated the effect of social inequalities in the mitigation uh, on the mitigation of COVID-19 across different areas of the city of Santiago de Chile, which is a city that is uh, highly segregated with uh, characterized by a strong income divide and here in the map uh, on, on the right shows this effect where basically the northeast part of the city is very wealthy and, uh, and uh, characterized by a, a high level of development, uh, uh, while the rest uh, of, of the city, especially uh, the northwestern part, uh, are uh, characterized by uh, poorer neighborhoods. And, and this striking uh, difference uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the structure, so the, the, the inequality that, that characterizes the, the city, had a profound impact on the spread of COVID-19 in Santiago, uh, and uh, especially on the eff uh, effect of the mobility restrictions that were imposed, and, and what we could uh, estimate through the mobile phone data is that uh, the, the reduction in, in mobility between the different uh, um, neighborhoods of Santiago uh, as was highly uh, correlated with the human development index where 
higher human development index was associated uh, with a, a larger uh, the reduction in mobility. Uh, so mobility reduction were highly differentiated by income in general and wealthier neighborhoods could afford prolong the social distancing while uh, poorer neighborhoods could not. Uh, and this is an effect that was also observed in other studies in different countries. And in our case, in this work, we could uh, uh, use epidemic simulation to show that the more equitable social distancing could have prevented up to 70% of observed deaths in Santiago during the first wave, if we could assume that uh, um, the reduction in mobility uh, uh, were equal across the different, uh, um, the different neighborhoods. Uh, so finally, I want to conclude that uh, about the, the outlook on this line of research that COVID-19 pandemic has opened uh, clearly a new era in, in, the, in digital epidemiology, because now we, we, we see that we measure behavioral responses to an epidemic uh, in, uh, in real time uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, with mobile phone data. And uh, there are, of course, many challenges ahead, ethical challenges in use of this data, the fact that the data is not representative, and the fact that we need a strong collaboration between uh, institutions and uh, um, uh, research institutions and, and private companies. And uh, I'm going to conclude here the presentation. Of course, I'm really happy to uh, discuss uh, uh, more details uh, about what I've presented so far. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. This is great. Any, uh, I, should we take questions in between, at least like, the, if they're very pertinent to the talk? Yes, right? Or should we just keep going? Let's keep going. Okay, the next one up is Giovanni Petri um, on how to talk to whales and why. Hey, hello. Um, well, you heard a lot about uh, me talking about uh, higher order stuff, but it's actually not what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to talk, if I manage to share my desktop, why is it not letting me share desktop anymore? Uh -huh. So let's see what happens if I do this. What are you seeing? in the wrong screen okay sorry about that why is this happening mm -hmm. okay. you haven't learned how to share a screen in two years of pandemic i haven't no. it's actually the thing is that uh i don't know why because i tried it earlier and it was working very well it's just uh Come on, you do seems that are tough than that so i do but it's finally it's uh, okay let me not not because I've got two screens. Okay, let's try this way. If I kill one screen, what happens now? Sorry about that. Okay. Let's see if we can share. Is this the correct one? Yeah, let's try. Yep, there you go. Yeah, uh, this is something now. Okay. So do you see the yeah, you see the right one. Okay, so I'm not going to be talking about um, whales, actually. Sorry, I'm going to be talking about whales, not higher order uh, interactions or brains. And if you want to talk to me about that, you can do that uh, later. Uh, and actually, I'll be talking about how we can talk to them and also why. And, and let's start from that part, right? So there are multiple reasons why we want to be talking to whales. Uh, the first one is ecological, right? So by the idea is that we can you can try to extend what we mean by so us and we, uh, that is not just humans, and in the hope that it will actually help people to realize that there is a nature around us and can actually protect us. Now, this might seem, uh, might seem actually far-fetched, but there is pre previous evidence for this. Like, for example, in the 60s, Roger Payne, who was actually part of this project, uh, discovered that whales sing to one another. And, and the recording, Songs of the Humpback Whales, sparked the Save the Whales movement, which is still one of the most successful conservation initiatives in history. Right? So imagine what would happen if we actually manage to understand them, maybe communicate back, right? And of course, there is a scientific reason, which is, you know, whales are effectively the most alien species to us on Earth. So they were fish, they went to ground, became mammals, went back into the sea. They live inherently in 3D, and they also experience vastly different environments, you know, very, very dark and, and deep environments and very shallow ones. So they're effectively a testbed for communication with, like, aliens, if ever there would be a contact. Uh, so the project is called SETI, you know, to, go back to the original project SETI with an S, okay? But the point is, why sperm whales? Well, uh, they have the largest brain of any species and they actually share a lot of, of traits that are strikingly similar to us. So they have high level functions. There is evidence for conscious, th to some degree, conscious thought and, and planning. Uh, they talk to each other, apparently, and they show evidence of you know, feelings, even towards divers. Sometimes they save your life if you're in, in trouble. 
uh, and they have culture. You know, they live in a matriarchal, uh, multicultural society. They have dialects. They have strong multi-generational family bonds. Uh, they actually coordinate. They, they, they teach each other how to hunt. They share hunting techniques. You have waves of different ways of speaking that sort of cross the oceans as well. Okay? So that's why it's interesting for you to look at them. Now, how are we going to do this, right? So uh, really the, the biggest thing that we're going to be doing is deploy a, a large scale core whale listening system as it's called, which is basically an array of hydrophones. Which should, be, should be about 20 kilometers or 20 kilometers off the coast of Dominica there in Roseau, as you see. Uh, and we already have the first prototypes in the water. The, the boys will be about 700 meters deep and they will record at every, at every uh, service. And the, the final ones will be deployed this summer. And at that point, the actual, the actual big data uh, recording uh, initiative will start. Then the idea is to basically using these uh, phones and a bunch of other uh, techniques, for example, uh, tags attached to the whales, robots to follow them and so on, to build on a substantial data set that already exists, but it's very small by the, the amount of data we would be collecting in a year or so on whale sound, social lives, behavior, and so on. So the idea is that we're trying to put everything together and with the, with the sort of aim of getting a sort of large scale pipeline that will allow us to integrate all this data. And of course, you know, then you will use techniques from machine learning, natural language processing, data science, uh, generically, to try and make sense of all, of all this information. As you can imagine, the information from both the, the, the sound and the behavior is very important because, you know, when you talk to someone and you use a new word with a new language, you point to something. So it's, it's, it's important to have uh, an agreement between behavioral data and just sounding. And of course, all of this data then will be uh, distributed using a public interface, all the tools will be there. Okay. So what are we doing? I mean, ISI, as you heard, it's a very applied, uh, it's a very sort of mathy intensive, at least to some, to some degree institution. So what, what are we doing in here? Well, um, let me just go you know, back one sec. So the current consensus of how these sperm whales sort of talk to each other is that they communicate via clicks. So now these clicks are created on the top of their head, basically their nose, and then the sound sort of echoes back into the head and then is motivated by a number of bone lenses in their head. It just comes out, okay? So, so far, whale experts sort of recognize a certain set of codas, which are a coherent set of clicks, you know, four, five, seven clicks, and so on. They are thought to basically be behave like words or syllables to us. However, this actually was never really confirmed. Right? So what we did here was we, we started to adapt some techniques from human languages to measure the information density of sperm whales at different resolutions. So we're taking like one coda, two codas, three codas, also sub coda, uh, which is very important because, I mean, at the level of the coda, we know that there is a structure, but we don't really know how, whether they're conjugating these things or whether they're actually attaching them in different ways and so on. So we started looking at that. <clears throat> and the interesting bit is that even if you start with basically very standard macro chain models to this trend describe, you know, for example, the intertime and how they combine these clicks together, we find evidence for some sort of transition between three and four clicks, so, so subcoda level, right? Of course, this is not sufficient, right? Because it might be that some codas are below uh, three or two or four, there are some that are lower, shorter and, uh, or longer. So what we actually did here, we, we went to something, we used something which is a bit more complicated, which is called variable length mark of chains. And the beautiful thing about these things is that you can look at them as networks. And here you basically are coding for different levels of memory, right? And for example, what you see here on the left, the, the graph that I'm showing you is an example of uh, the dependencies of different distributions of probabilities of memories for certain patterns of clicks within a certain way. And on the right, there is the sanity check, which is if you actually shuffle this, you don't get anything anymore. Of course, now we're doing this for multiple whales. We're trying to see, for example, whether calves learn to speak different, you know, they have different trees of this type because they have to develop as they learn. But of course, we don't really have that much uh, uh, data so far because, you know, as I was saying, the, the main data co uh, collection will start this, this summer. The cute part is that we can actually go back to humans and then try and figure out whether the human trees that we would extract in terms of, you know, this variable landmark of chain look like the ones of the whales or they are or they actually are much more complex now uh, what you're seeing here on the bottom is something that looks it's, it's been made out from a bunch of english books um, um the trick unfortunately i cannot really show you the complete comparison because we did it at the level of the corpus and actually this should be done at the level of the syllables and it's very hard to go from corpus and syllables given you know the, the tools that we have there but we're getting better at this and it actually seems that you know the the structure that of course humans have is a lot more complex than the one you would find in ways, but it's actually not that much more complex. And you know, stay tuned, stay tuned for more. 
Now, in terms of outline, uh, I think this is an interesting uh, project because of course there is much more to do. I mean, we're literally still developing the tags that should go on the whales without sort of piercing them and so on. And we just got our first sailboat, right? Of course, if you have a project in Dominica, you know, you want to go there because, you know, most of the work is going to be done on the sea in the Caribbean. Um, but, you know, if you go, if you, if you actually assume this is to some degree successful, what you would like to see here is like to, this to scale to a bunch of other species, you know? So the idea is that the discoveries we make here can be actually used as foundation to understand communications in other animals, both on oceans and land. So like elephants, birds, gorillas, and so on. And I actually very much like to talk about this project because I think it's probably one of the first examples of like big science and complex systems in a sense that it does feel a lot like one of those large physics collaborations where you have some people on one side that are developing instruments to certain specs to collect and others that are creating models to learn to what and how to ask questions when the data will be collected. Of course, this is not the first one. You know, there have been other examples, but I think this is extremely large. And it's actually truly interdisciplinary because we have here you see a, a bunch of, of people, also the, the, the core group. And here we have biologists, acoustic experts, cryptographer, Shafi Goldwasser is a, is a, has a medal uh, to an award in that, deep learning people, robotics people actually building the robots that are gonna fo follow the animals. Um, Dandy Deluni there is for National Geographic because this, all this thing will be covered. And so, on. so I think this is extremely interesting because it's a different type of project and a different type of kind of scientific environment and scientific, um, attempt uh, compared to what you usually do. And in fact, actually, if you're asking where the money came from, they came from that audacious project that you see there. Uh, that's an initiative by TED. Uh, every year they collect a bunch of proposals in terms of what if questions. You know, what if we could cure malaria? What if we could talk to whales? And, and we actually won one of these, which is about $35 million for four years. Of course, we didn't get that much money because most of that goes like, you know, in the hardware, the boys, the boats and so on. Uh, but of course, you know, this is a kind of, of different ways also of thinking about how we can find fundings for other things. Now, the link that you find there, that archive link is a roadmap paper. So if you're interested in knowing more, you can go there. And of course, there is the website there. And I'm happy to get any other questions from you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. This is great. And also, thank you very much for extending the scope uh, of uh, cultural data analytics to non-human species. <laughs> which uh, I think is actually very, very important um, because um, typically the fields from which we all come, cultural history, cultural semiotics, art history, linguistics, and so on, are typically not only focusing only on humans, but also focusing on the documented part of human history, which is a tiny sliver of the two to 500,000 years that we are around where the stomach was already smaller, the brain was already larger. So that is really, really cool. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next one up is Daniela Paolotti. Um, Hello. We'll talk about non-traditional approaches for public health practice. Hello, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Uh, very pleased to be here and, and grateful for the opportunity to present uh, uh, today the work we have been doing at ISI. I am uh, a senior research scientist um, in the uh, data science for social impact and sustainability research area directed by Ichiro. And today I will talk a little bit about how you can revolutionize public health practices, let's say. So let me start uh, by sharing my screen uh, and uh, uh, here is my presentation. Um, so yeah, the focus today is on uh, public health and how we can change it. It's something that uh, you will hear a lot uh, from my colleagues. You uh, have heard a lot um, from Chiro Yamir, the fact that ISI will work with epidemiology, with uh, diseases, uh, and in general with the public health. And uh, not uh, all of you might know that public health actually deals not only with the research on diseases, but also uh, to promote uh, in general, the wellness of the individuals and on the general population. And there is a huge work on preventing whatever might affect the health of individuals. So given uh, these uh, broad scope uh, of uh, public health activities, uh, 
Nowadays, as you might imagine, digital technologies, new uh, interdisciplinary methodologies from data science and social sciences play a huge role in the way we study uh, health. Uh, we ha you have heard about the fact that ISI, um, we work on computational social science from a really uh, diverse perspective, focusing on complex systems, machine learning, data mining, network science, uh, and applied to health, these uh, uh, translates on uh, the possibility to study uh, the health of populations, of individuals, uh, uh, modeling how infectious diseases spread, uh, what is the risk for the health uh, of uh, population groups uh, and individuals. And so really a, a diverse set of activities that are uh, at the interface between uh, health and uh, data science or computational social science. But um, today I would like to uh, talk to you about uh, an activity that we have been uh, carrying forward at ISI for more than 10 years now, and that focuses on not only uh, using non-traditional approaches to track diseases, but also to study uh, how individuals are at risk of developing uh, specific infectious diseases and how uh, behavioral change can be leveraged to really, uh, uh, let's say, mitigate uh, the spreading of a disease and uh, how data can help us inform models uh, about behavioral uh, change. Uh, and in particular, I will talk to you about uh, an activity that uh, involves individuals, uh, um, volunteers uh, that uh, uh, in Europe uh, provide information about their health status. This uh, activity uh, is uh, called participatory surveillance and stems from the need that we had uh, really before the previous pandemic in 2009 to uh, collect uh, high resolution data in space and in time about disease circulation to inform uh, large scale uh, um, spreading models for influenza like illness uh, diseases. So imagine a pre-COVID world, a, a pre-2009 pandemic uh, world where you needed to inform your um, mobility based models about who and when uh, and where was affected by influenza. Influenza. And that's why uh, we mm, devised uh, um, a network called InfluenzaNet that was relying on uh, technologies that uh, at that time we called uh, Web 2.0 when there were the first uh, platforms where users were contributing with the information and content. And the idea was to involve directly uh, individuals from the general population that would not necessarily go see a doctor for their symptoms, but that would be willing to uh, provide uh, this kind of information in a platform that was uh, um, directly connected to public health authorities. And so that's how we designed the study behind the influenza net, which is basically a network of platforms that are nowadays comprising uh, most of the uh, Western uh, Europe and that are um, disseminated through communication campaigns uh, um, uh, among the general population that to get to know about these studies. Um, whoever resides in a country where a platform is deployed can participate and fill in a survey with uh, information about, for example, where they live, uh, their age and gender, their household composition, their chronic diseases. And then each week during the influenza season, uh, they can report uh, whether they had symptoms or not. So even healthy people that uh, uh, form our denominators are important. And then we ask uh, follow-up information, like for example, whether they visited a doctor, whether uh, they uh, took time off for work or school, whether they took uh, medicines for their illness. And the interesting thing is that uh, uh, this allows us to collect uh, uh, uniform data across many countries in a way that is uh, quite hard for traditional, uh, let's say, surveillance systems. The network is now uh, comprised of uh, uh, 12 countries uh, um, and uh, 12 platforms that, as I said, cover most of the uh, Western uh, Europe. And the interesting thing is that you get uh, super uniform and harmonized epidemiological data. 
But not only that, you also uh, collect information about, for example, uh, attitudes towards vaccination, uh, behaviors, uh, healthcare seeking uh, uh, patterns. And um, during the uh, COVID pandemic, these platforms have been readily converted to collect information from influenza like illness to uh, COVID. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, what started as a research project uh, aimed at collecting uh, higher resolution data for epidemic models uh, has become a mainstream uh, surveillance tool in uh, many European countries. And in fact, the platform in the majority of the countries is run directly by the National Institute of Public Health. We have uh, the Robert Koch in Germany, in in France, uh, the former Public Health uh, England uh, um, in the UK. Um, so basically, uh, public health institutions that are in direct connections, short-circuited with the general population that uh, uh, even during the pandemic uh, provided information and also received detailed information about the circulation of the disease uh, and about uh, the latest uh, um, news uh, uh, that uh, were affecting the population during uh, normal times uh, but also during the uh, pandemic. These data are so interesting that um, the European Center for Disease Control asked us to start including uh, uh, the data from the platforms in their weekly balloting uh, that they jointly publish with the WHO Europe called Flu News Europe. Uh, the interesting part is that uh, not only we can provide uh, information about the circulation of the disease, but we can also say how many people went uh, to a doctor for their illness. So we can say how many people got tested for, uh, for COVID and how many reported a positive uh, um, result. So these uh, uh, disease-related but also behavioral information um, are so important for public health authorities because uh, uh, collecting them with traditional approaches is uh, rather hard. And this approach has become so uh, innovative and so, uh, let's say, cost-effective that the World Health Organization is helping us uh, writing guidelines to promote this new surveillance approach uh, in member states uh, all over the world. So not only focusing on Europe, but anybody who wants to adopt this approach uh, has now um, these, uh, let's say, guidelines, this document uh, directly provided by WHO to adopt uh, this, uh, this new system. And even the European Commission has uh, recognized the importance of this approach that has received funding in several European projects, including um, one that was funded in the latest call, emergency call on variants of concern, and that focuses on pregnant women and, uh, and children. And the idea is to really uh, collect additional behavioral um, and contacts, for example, data to inform uh, uh, transmission models uh, focusing on variants of concern for population groups uh, for which uh, data are not so abundant, like, for example, children and pregnant women. And uh, um, with this, I will conclude and thank you and apologize in advance because I will have to leave in a few minutes to attend a, a European Commission project meeting that is ongoing. And so, I, unfortunately, I cannot stay for the whole discussion. But thank you so much for uh, your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so maybe in this case, we should we should um, give the opportunity to ask a question if there is one. Uh, I think one I have one question, which is uh, um, sort of I, I, this kind of um, project is something that is sort of hardest to set up because you want to sort of keep it going for a really long time and you want to sort of like ensure sort of the consistency. But then once this happens, Decades later, often people have very different ideas and do different things. Like famously, uh, you know, Chris Fowler and uh, Nicholas Christakis's work with the Framingham Heart Study, for example, which was collected in the 70s. So, is that something that you also see going? That you say, okay, this is data we collected for the flu, but there's like 5,000 other things we can do with this data. 
that's a really a million dollar question, of course. <laughs> uh, and uh, given that it involves uh, uh, participants and how their behavior and attitudes change, uh, well, these platforms have to adapt uh, to uh, rapidly changing uh, uh, contexts and conditions. But I think that this approach, uh, given that it's quite flexible, um, is capable to keep up with these changes. If you think that we first deployed the, uh, the very first prototype in uh, 2009, at the beginning of the first wave of uh, the pandemic uh, um, in, in the UK. And uh, we were capable of capturing uh, uh, pandemic flu and the attitude of people towards uh, seeking healthcare assistance. And then over the years, we managed to Mm, uh, collect information about vaccine uh, hesitancy, vaccine attitudes, uh, uh, and also how people change their behavior in terms of adopting uh, uh, preventive measures like uh, hand washing or wearing masks. Uh, and then recently we um, collected information during the first phases of the pandemic about the risk perception. So the idea is that the system provides a framework, but then it's really up to the surveillance and research team to keep up with methodologies that can collect data that are still relevant after a decade. And um, uh, for example, surveys have become a very popular way to collect information now that uh, you can disseminate them through Facebook. And this was not the case 10 years ago when we started this, uh, this approach. So uh, I think this, this approach is flexible enough to uh, be able to go on for, for decades, provided that uh, the connection with the, the, the social context and the epidemiological context uh, is strong and uh, the methodologies are kept up to speed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no hands lifted so far, so let's go on with uh, um, Yelena Meova, um, who is from our region here. Um, and she will talk about supporting humanitarian response and public health with text analysis. Yes, hello. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, organizing this. This is a great opportunity for us to talk about our work. Um, I hope that the connection is okay. I started crapping out right as I had to speak. Uh, so let me know if I'm breaking. So let's share the screen. Is it working? Yes. Excellent. So, um, so actually, I am from Russia. So these days, I'm feeling uh, very uncomfortable, to tell you the least. Um, but surviving. Um, so, so it only uh, is suitable that I'll be talking about humanitarian response today. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about a couple of uh, collaborations that we have, um, just as uh, examples of the kind of work that we do. Uh, so uh, let me begin with IDMC, the International Displacement Monitoring Center, um, which is an NGO that's dedicated to monitoring internal displacement worldwide. And they provide uh, this data, so they aggregate it, analyze it, and provide it to uh, international partners, including uh, United Nations um, and International Organization for Migration. So uh, one of the tools that they're using is called iDetect, and it's an in-house platform that tracks um, uh, displacement and processes uh, many documents uh, that are news articles and reports to um, to basically uh, organize and display this information. Um, so actually, there is already a system that uses a bit of natural language processing and machine learning, uh, but most of the processing is usually done by hand, and. Uh, what we did with this, um, with this project is trying to understand whether we can automate more of the process. So for example, it was very interesting to work with the experts in iDetect who uh, label documents and process them every day 
to help us create a collection of uh, very uh, high quality annotated documents that can be used for uh, training models for information extraction. And this was actually very interesting because uh, the, the process is very uh, involved um, and we basically made a schema that we can now share with the research community and other uh, humanitarian uh, projects that is quite complete uh, for, for processing documents. And we also made it for several languages, for English, uh, French, and Spanish. And of course, we've uh, tried already making some, um, uh, some uh, machine learning sizes. Uh, which have not yet been integrated into the system, but we keep working uh, with them. So another way that uh, we're trying to work in the humanitarian sector is IMAP. Um, interestingly, I still have not found out what IMAP stands for. <laughs> I have asked it several people. Uh, Chigo, if you know, you know. Um, but basically, it is a nonprofit again um, that uh, basically provides information management services to humanitarian and uh, development organizations. And to do, they have this Deep, which is an open source platform where um, it helps uh, humanitarian basically to centralize and um, process their documents and keep track of uh, the very many documents that are produced uh, on the field and nationally. So it's uh, an open source tool and it was developed in collaboration with that friendly space that we're working on right now. And uh, it's, it's a very similar situation to IDMC where it is loosely uh, automated, but is mostly done by hand. Um, so what we uh, have already contributed to their system is uh, creating a, a universal text extractor for any sort of documents. Uh, this is, of course, not uh, research, right? But we, um, we it, it was a necessary step, not only to contribute to their tool, but also to um, create our own data sets. To, to take their data and make it workable for us. Um, and now uh, we are working on improving their classification, which is actually quite involved. Um, so we're analyzing the different uh, tasks that they may have to perform on this. And uh, as we are um, creating these machine uh, learning tools, we're realizing that uh, it's necessary to have uh, domain-specific data uh, resource to understand the language of the humanitarian response. Um, so just as there is um, a general language BERT model, uh, we're trying to create a data set that will help in creating um, text representations that will be specific to uh, humanitarian settings. Uh, so we're right now we're using uh, Relief Web, um, which is a resource uh, specifically for the humanitarian sector, and GDELT, which is a large collection of news sources. You're probably all familiar with it. Um, so, yeah, so, so we are hoping to contribute both to the, uh, to the deep project, but as well to the larger research community so that there are tools for processing the text uh, in this domain. Another way that we interact with, with uh, humanitarian, humanitarian sector, and this is closer to public health, is uh, the US National Eating Disorders Association. So it's an association that's dedicated to uh, supporting individuals and families with um, eating disorders. So anorexia, bulimia, um, and many other uh, disordered eating behaviors. What they do is every, uh, at the end of every February, they 
have a public health campaign where they um, they are trying to uh, raise awareness uh, and promote a, a certain message. For example, I think it's actually ongoing right now. Um, and so what we did was collaborate with them to understand the reach and uh, the most powerful, uh, most impactful ways that they could uh, uh, go about this campaign. So we've collected social media posts that they have posted and monitored the way that people who have interacted with these posts uh, then have their behavior change. So then we could provide a few insights about um, the kind of topics that really hit people that they continued listening to. And that was beyond the actual time span of the, uh, of the intervention of the campaign. So we were trying to see what are the longer term impacts of what they're doing. So we, we keep uh, working with them as well. And finally, um, we are doing also a lot of work that is uh, not in collaboration uh, with anybody specifically, but our uh, one of our in research uh, vaccination hesitancy, and that was even before um, COVID. And of course, actually gave us a lot of interesting insights in the fact that we could uh, compare vaccination hesitancy from before the pandemic to what is happening now. So we are looking both at the Italian uh, scenario and uh, over time, but also looking at the broader uh, European and worldwide uh, anti-vaccination uh, information and uh, supporters. For example, right now we are trying to understand the uh, the ways in which anti-vaccination content travels between countries and whether there is uh, not only national but an international echo chamber. Uh, so, for example, here in the first uh, bit here, you can see that uh, we can find um, the communities that are separated by their opinions on social media and here it's on Twitter. And what we can do is see the progression uh, of these opinions and how people join them and from what uh, entry points they, they, they take, et cetera. So both, both nationally and internationally. And what we can do after the fact by recrawling the data is to see what is the extent of the platform's moderation of this misinformation. So uh, for example, we find that uh, English language platforms are of course favored for this sort of moderation, but Russian and Cuban are over moderated, so, or moderated much more than the others. So there are many more suspended accounts, which is also interesting to find. So in all of this, I would like to say uh, it's possible, a, a lot of it is supported by the uh, Lagrange Fellowship that is uh, supported by Charity Foundation. And this allows us not only to um, establish these collaborations and get uh, access to data and uh, expertise that we might have not otherwise, but the duration of this Fellowship is one year, which is perfect for a young researcher to uh, learn a few tools, but also to write a proper paper or contribute a proper software to a project. And through this fellowship, uh, I think for almost all of the projects that I've mentioned, we had some fellows who were working on these and have done a great job. And so, but also not only for us, but for them, uh, we are able to provide a bit of training um, to acquaint them with what data science is, and many of them uh, go on to get PhDs, which we're very happy about. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was very fascinating.
I can add a little fact about Gidelt was uh, um, founded by Caliph Letaru, uh, who has Estonian roots. Um, and uh, together with a person called Patrick Brandt, who was a colleague of mine at UT Dallas. So <laughs> it's a really interesting coincidence to see that again. Um, very, very, very interesting. And um, so I think uh, maybe um, I, I can open the floor uh, to questions. I see that Chiro also uh, posted a lot of links in the chat um throughout the as links from throughout the presentations and um so maybe um Chiru, you had a much better looking slide than my text uh, um that i have for the program maybe so people can remember what uh, um the, the the lineup of talks for the questions maybe we share that screen and then people can actually move wherever make it as large as they want that I think would be great. Um, so yes, um, should we? Just, just one second. Very good. So we have 30 minutes to go, uh, basically. And so um, I see there's already one hand up. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think there is one common denominator, which in relation to what we are doing is, is quite interesting. So we're working across the university also with external partners. But uh, as we are sort of like uh, incubating from scratch, in a sense, um, we have six senior fellows, six PhD fellows and uh, faculty and several projects we are intertwined with. And um, so one of the interesting questions is exactly how to build these kind of like more sustainable pipelines where ideally all the senior fellows in the end would end up uh, sort of like forming their own groups and so on. And obviously we would sustain the incubator over time. And so uh, we have seen a lot of really interesting examples there. So thank you very much for, for that. So this is more a comment than a question, but, but it's, I'm very, very excited about this. So Mila Oiba, who's a senior fellow in Kudan, uh, has the first question. Uh, I have actually two questions for two persons, if that's okay, or I can divide them. Is that um, four or is it two? No, I'm kidding. Two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first of all, uh, really thank you all for, for these super interesting uh, projects and, and kind of like talking about your work. I think, you know, there is a wealth of, of uh, really interesting con uh, content. So I'm kind of like, I, I was... Um, you know, it's difficult to choose where to really concentrate on my, because all this is really thrilling. Um, uh, however, I, I, I have actually two questions, one for Michele and, and um, the second one for um, Jelena. Um, so Michele, um, I, I'm kind of like, it's, it's super interesting how you are able to use the mobile phone data to especially detect different kinds of um, urban areas and, and how kind of um, the COVID affects and, and you know, uh, and uh, showing also the differences in incomes and, and so on. Um, I just um, started to think that um, now that you have these findings concerning uh, COVID and, and the restrictions, so would it be somehow possible to um, then use this information for, uh, you know, providing some lessons learned uh, for for other um, maybe disciplines or other such as urban uh, planning or or things like that. Um, well, maybe um, just to um, so I'm I'm cultural historian myself, and I I'm kind of like. Mm, thinking a lot about how different, how we can use um, different data sets from for for different kinds of research questions, obviously, and 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 how data, in a way, contains also um, kind of like different kinds of layers of information. So there might be some some raw data, but then um, also the ways we produce uh, the data and, and the data is, is being kind of like inserted in, in some, some ways also affects and, and is shown in, in the data. So kind of like my, my question um, of kind of like different um, 
uses and, and uh, further excavating uh, interesting findings kind of like comes from, from, from this background. Um, I, I hope yeah, that my, my question is somehow, somehow understandable. Um, maybe I'll, I'll continue and, and, um, and ask my question to uh, Yelena. Let, um, let me kill the answer and then like- uh, Yes, okay, on. let's okay? do that. Thank thanks, Thank yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, so yes, uh, thanks for the question. And uh, absolutely, I mean, um, in general, uh, I, I, I focused my, my talk on, uh, especially on the use of mobile phone data um, for in, the, in, the, in the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because I mean, this has been uh, um, the main line research of the group, but at the same time, uh, from um, understanding mobility uh, through uh, mobile uh, from data and digital traces in general um, uh, is, is very relevant across domains, not only for public health. And as an example, I can mention here uh, another example uh, of, a, of a work that uh, we, we carried out also with uh, uh, under, under the lead of, of Chiro and with Leticia Govan and uh, um, several partners, uh, again in Santiago de Chile, using the same uh, type of data uh, that I described briefly uh, from Telefonica. Uh, in that case, the project was aimed at understanding gender differences in mobility. So to understand uh, whether uh, women or men move differently in, uh, in the city, in the urban space and um, this is one of the first uh, uh, projects actually that uh, tries to, to to tackle this question using this type of, of sources digital sources and we found that actually there were significant uh, differences in movement uh, patterns between women and men uh, something that is already known uh, from from the literature in a sense but uh, it's interesting that we can see these also from this type of traces. And of course, uh, apart from uh, understanding, so um, measuring differences of this type uh, using mobile phone data, uh, we can also uh, then uh, uh, test hypotheses on what are the other uh, factors that impact the differences of, of gender. So what, what we could do uh, in that project was to uh, compare the, this gap uh, of mobility between women and men because we observed the gap. So women uh, um, uh, tend to move uh, uh, less in our in what, for what we see for what we saw in, in Santiago de Chile. Also, combine this with social demographic uh, uh, factors uh, um, like uh, wealth, income, uh, and uh, and again we could see that uh, the, the the gap in in uh, in, uh, in income uh, tended to uh, widen the gap in mobility at the same time uh, between women and men. So uh, absolutely, I mean, I think that there is a, um, the, the last few years have seen a, a large increase in, uh, in opportunities of using this data for several uh, um, uh, social uh, and the human studies and uh, and yeah that's it and i think she is also adding more more information about uh, uh, about uh, about this so yeah thank you very much mila again <laughs> yeah yeah if you know if others want to you know yeah, yes. jump in but i i yeah i'll ask my question to to yelena so you know super interesting things that you're doing um especially the latter part of your your talk um kind of like where you discussed your your study on on um you know anti-vaccination contents traveling uh across countries this is uh, this is highly interesting um i myself uh studying circulation of knowledge um in kind of like long time span of history and, and how different technologies affect on, on kind of like what, how we know what we know about and how kind of like information moves. Um, and one of the studies that I have been doing is kind of like uh, related to Russia. I, I have been studying um, like these uh, different kinds of like historical narratives in, in uh, Russian online um, media and how certain kinds of discussions in Russia have, um, uh, somehow, uh, you know, traveled, for instance, to finish um, online discussions and, and so on. Um, 
but I'm I'm really curious to to you know if you could briefly tell a little bit more about your your pr project, especially I'm because I assume that the data that you are using is multilingual. So um, in some of the projects in which I have been working, there has been kind of like problems in kind of like computationally um, linking connections between uh, contents that are in different languages. So I'm, I'm really curious to know how do you, you know, what, what are the um, uh, kind of like, how do you create the connections between different uh, kinds of conversations in, in different languages and, and kind of like a little bit more about what kind of data do you use? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's a, it's a great question. And it is not easy for sure. Um, so of course, uh, a lot of these have been um, the Twitter studies, although looked at uh, like parenting forums as well. Uh, but the one on many languages is Twitter, just because it's used uh, quite in many countries. And we, uh, the whole idea of this data set was to collect it in many languages. So we actually selected 20 European languages and created parallel queries to, to collect all of this. Um, but of course, one of the difficult parts is identifying what is misinformation, right? So a lot of um, a lot of uh, signals that we try to look for are not even textual. It's a lot of it is who is retweeting whom, that is agnostic to a language, um, or what links they're sharing, which is also co-sharing of information. In that sense, being on internet makes. Great. Yelena, you still there? Something happened. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I came, the, I came you, and I went. Yeah, the sound was off. It just closed. Oh, really? That's weird. <laughs> yeah. Like you the were whole frozen thing and then the sound, the sound was off. And then, um, so maybe. Yeah. Not sure, not sure. But I'm back now. OK, OK. So, so non-textual signals are the best because we can collect them from everyone, like retweeting and posting content. But then at some point, yes, we have to actually manually label it, for example, and then we use Google Translate and basically finding any people that we can find from these different countries to have a bit of contextual understanding of what, what the tweets are about. So for sure that uh, limits the scope of the analysis. We are very multicultural here. So in fact, just we can, read a lot of languages and understand a lot of context. So that's very nice. Um, is finding resources about misinformation that are international. We can find a few that are, of course, very US centric. But if there are, uh, if we were to cover all of Europe, for example, it's very, very difficult. Uh, some just don't seem to keep track of, uh, of low quality sources like yeah. like some other countries. So it's still a struggle. Interesting. Um, Mark Metz has another question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for the interesting presentations. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a PhD student in, in Kodan uh, myself here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would continue with uh, uh, what the uh, Mila asked and, and um, uh, from Yelena uh, that so so you did I I'm still correct that you're building uh, sort of this uh, model for this uh, humanitarian uh, text specifically. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Are are you building a, a sort of a language model for the humanitarian text, right? Uh, yes. That, is yes, it like, we're trying to. Is this like multilingual text model or what is it? Well, that's another layer on it. So far, we're just trying to specialize the, the language representation for, for this domain, right? Basically try to have uh, the basic language um, training such as the BERT model for uh, this particular domain. 
-hmm. but then um, the then we would have even more specialized tools for each task, uh, right? For um, figuring out what kind of documents these are, uh, information ex extraction in, in various places. For example, recognizing who is in need. Right? There are so many ways to say it, uh, so it, it's not an easy task. But but it, it, it begins seems... with proper understanding of the language, right? It, it seems that it's it's not easy task either to know at, at which point do you need a specified model or how is it? Sorry? It, it's, it's not easy to say that um, uh, how specific the model has to be, right? Like on which text do you need a separate model? Or... Well, we, we're just trying to improve what is there because it's not working very well what is there right now, right? The, 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 link, the wording is often um, very specific. So we're just trying to improve um, the, the understanding of the text. But in the end, all of this is done with the rigorous testing, right? And, and a lot of times there are no uh, data sets for this task. So usually we are co-creating the data set with our collaborators and sitting them down and uh, trying to convince them to label uh, stuff for us. But hopefully this will be not only used for them uh, to understand how well their platforms actually work, which unfortunately a lot of platforms don't check. <laughs> they just assume that they have an AI and it just kind of solves everything. Um, uh, but we hoping to also contribute just to the research. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have to I also continue. Um, I also have a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so th this is a question to 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 all of you. Like what we have uh, seen is, in some sense, very representative. Because if you if you try to tap into the funding landscape and you want to do something for human society. Um, there is certain fields and areas that are very established, which is uh, broadly speaking sociology, which is broadly speaking uh, the medical slash biology fields, public health in a sense is an extension of this. And um, then there is certain things in that are, you could say, if you deal with culture proper, like meaning not the human behavior, but the product of human behavior, such as language, um, such as art, um, you have also done stuff in this area, like the Socio Patterns Project, um, tracking people in exhibitions, for example, or all the cultural stuff that happens around Easy and in Easy, um, is, is is an interesting example of that. So you're you're also pioneering and, and leading there too. Uh, yet it is interesting also to see that there is certain things that are ironically getting easier funding than other things. Like for example, if it's about Neolithic human culture, it's easier to get funding because you can run it under the moniker of ecology or anthropology. If it's ironically, it's about whale culture, it's probably easier than to do the same things with humans <laughs> where we know a little uh, about that kind of stuff. So the question is, in some sense, exactly, you, you, you're coming from the other direction, you're coming from these established fields and you also do cultural stuff or you're more affine to that than other people say maybe. And from our position is sort of like we try to say, okay, let's let's go beyond sort of, you know, just doing network analysis and some computational stuff in what is now called digital humanities and actually make it a proper multidisciplinary science and just, you know, like put the handbrake out and just go. And uh, there, there's, there, there's sort of two different affordances. We have like all these problems and it's difficult to find funding for that. And on the other hand, you got like a lot of problems um, that you get lots of funding for. And so it's probably sort of hard to go to this direction. So one of the key questions that I am carrying around for like 20, 30 years is how do we actually do this kind of larger scale research into cultural products, into aesthetics? In, and, and that is not only text, it's images, it's uh, film, it's creative industries, more general performing arts. Um, it is sort of the kind of interaction we have that is more than just like the social interaction. So how do we actually uh, sustain and build research in this area in a more, uh, in, in a broader sense, in the way that you are doing this, 
um, that is sort of something which which I would love to hear you, your opinion. Where you where do you say, oh, okay, we are in a very multidisciplinary place, but there is boundaries. There is boundedness. There are certain things we can do, and there are certain things we love to do, but we can't. Um, so 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 where where's the front of what we need to build together? To where, where can cultural data science uh, or cultural science go uh, that currently we can't? Uh, or we can in as a side project, basically. Yes, Chiro. I have a quick reaction, Max. It's it's a great question. I don't have an answer, especially because I don't have any domain expertise, right? So, um, but um, but what I can offer is that my sensation is that things will improve vastly because of the. Uh, I think the COVID crisis was a turning point in that respect. I think it. It made it evident uh, that uh, you cannot create uh, systems uh, and responses that are uh, value neutral, that are culturally neutral. And then when you try to, uh, to use just scientists and engineers to, to intervene into social systems, you are, uh, you are necessarily creating monsters. And, and that's, you know, preaching the choir here. We all know this, uh, but uh, but uh, but for decision makers, that's not obvious, right? And in a sense, you know that there is this wave of techno solutionism. I saw this, for example, I was in the the, the, the digital contact tracing task force of the Italian government, uh, liaising with with the other European countries, and and you know the initial reaction was, "Give us all the data; you can trust us." And the answer was, "No, we cannot." <laughs> and, 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 this, and this complexity is the complexity that we can navigate. It's not simply, you know, we need to protect health of people, so give us all the data. Uh, we, we need to be more sophisticated in how we partition the space, you know, we think about these problems. And what this pointed to is that, what do you need to think about problems this way? You need people trained in humanities, in liberal arts. You don't need the engineers. You cannot engineer your way out of this. You cannot science your way out of this either. So this is also why several of the best polytechnic schools in Europe right now, like think EPFL, but also like the Polytechnic University in Torino here just launched a similar initiative. They are starting having humanities programs in polytechnic schools, in engineering schools, mm -hmm. because they now realize that uh, if, we, if we train engineers without that type of sensibility, then down the line, we are going to pay, pay pay the price of technology designed, you know, in the ignorance of, of what, of centuries of knowledge. Uh, and and so, so that's the boundary we need to crack. And, and of course, you know, I don't have a solution, but I have the impression that things are gonna improve because now the problem is dramatically evident in some, uh, and, and think of AI, think of how AI enters our societies, right? I mean, uh, it's clear that we, we cannot just use engineers for that. I mean, we, we need to do better and more, and we need people with a broader culture. And so my, my impression is that this will trickle down eventually, and probably very fast, to funding very different things from the, from, from the traditional ones, because there will be a renewed urgency that we need. People who can think about culture uh, as a system, as you do. I can only offer this. I know it's not much. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Um, there is one question in chat. Ah, OK. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so Hannah has a question. Uh, you want to you wanna summarize it? It seems that Hannah needed, she couldn't stay longer. And that's why ah, she, okay. she posted this on Slack. Ah, OK. So, um, OK. So let's do it for the record. Okay, so um, okay, now this is a very good one. I give you, I give you the last two lines of this. Um, how do you balance slash accommodate business interests with public good purposes? I can try to take a job at this one, but I don't want to monopolize the discussion. So if any of my colleagues want to want to take this, I'm very happy. And if not, I will take it very quickly. Um, I mean, the, there's a problem there, right? I mean, the, the problem is that, uh, of course, data always has uh, double use, and, uh, and data is always an act of power. I mean, measuring somebody is an act of power, 
And, uh, and, when we feel, and the reason why we sometimes feel so uneasy about these big platforms is because they measure us and they monetize our behaviors. And, uh, you know, we feel dehumanized by this, uh, objectified in a sense by this, right? So uh, using data for good has got two problems. The, the, the big problem is the for good part. I mean, we are using for good as a shorthand, but the reality is that for good stated like this is very paternalistic, it's very naive. So of course, uh, for good we mean for positive social impact and who defines what is positive social impact is are the problem owners we we never want to venture in our at least in our research area in the territory where scientists do something because we think it's for good that's why we partner with, with humanitarian organization with domain experts who know the problem and who can guide us uh, in, in both finding problems that have a real impact, but also in steering clear of the, you know, the dualities that are dangerous. Sometimes simply materializing data about a, a minority might actually endanger them. And, uh, and some data should not exist uh, in, the, in the first place, in a sense. So uh, the, the answer is that you partner up with domain experts, uh, uh, and then, of course, you know, you use best practices in data processing. So for example, Michele was mentioning about this work on uh, gender uh, resolved uh, um, human mobility in uh, in Santiago. What we did there is that the data never left the the, the 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 data centers of the telco. We are normally sending code, computing stuff, getting back indicators. Some data should not travel, should not be moved. Uh, the same holds true for the other data sets uh, that, that, we, that we discussed. Uh, and of course, you know there are technical means. There is differential privacy. There are a bunch of other techniques that you can use but of course them alone are not enough you need to you need to create also trusted perimeters and you need to vet the partners this is also why i think that funders um, need to play uh, and are starting to play a much bigger role and especially philanthropists because they they come with a neutral mission they can make things happen because of the funding but they're also versed and they have the culture which comes from the humanities of creating trusted perimeters uh, and, and making sure that you, you try and generate the best value for all. It's no surprise that today, if you go to data.org, you find the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, you find the philanthropy. It's not, it's not a, a chance that right now the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation is focusing squarely on data. In Switzerland, Botner Foundation, some of these are our partners. So uh, I think that in the sense the nonprofit sector needs to step up the game because it comes with an awareness and the culture of the social mission and its neutrality that I think can, can help us generate the good kind of impact and stave off the risks. So this is my short answer to this, but many frameworks are actually emerging and I put some link in the, in the chat and OECD, think just of the data act. The European commission is actually leader in this. We started with GDPR, and now, you know, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, and there is a lot of language of togetherness, of, you know, of social um, uh, cohesion in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, new legislation. So we, we have a very strong hope of what Europe can show in this respect, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I, we, we have actually three minutes to go. I want to close the loop to where we started today, which is the situation of the world, where we are definitely all together the problem owners. Um, and some of us can contribute, others cannot. Uh, there is a lot of things that I think are applicable to, uh, you know, where we need to bring in our, you know, humanities expertise, where we bring in uh, art expertise, where we bring in science expertise, and so on, uh, in different ways. Um, and it's also important that we're mutually aware of what we're doing. Like, um, I'd like to pick up on, on, on two things, you know, there's the sort of, you could say, diffuse things. Like, uh, yeah, everybody since the 60s, at least once in their life, dreamt about talking to whales or using sign language to talk to the octopus, um, which is probably more alien. Um, while at the same time, there is other things that are much more straightforward. And what Yelena uh, showed, uh, this thing of like vaccine hesitancy. We're in a situation right now where uh, the front line is not only in the Ukraine, the front line goes through all European parliaments because the parties that support that guy in Moscow actually have two digit percentages. They all speak different languages. They all have the same fundamentalist, stupid, simple message. Um, 
And that is, I think, something that where we all own the problem together. And I think where we have to wake up and we cannot say, oh, we just vote these people out. We uh, sort of do our thing, like we do only computer science or we only sort of run a social media company or dating platform, or we only, I analyze my paintings and that's it. I think that's where we really have to actively search how to sort of academically mix and, and bring things together that uh, can provide solutions. And I think that is something which um, at least drives me every day to sort of engage in this kind of um, academic mixing for understanding cultural interaction and cultural dynamics. Uh, which we owe a lot to places like ISI, to complexity science, to network science, and uh, fields which have transcended the individual already, like systems biology, the medicine, data science, and so on. And I think that is something which I think is, is, is a very important point. Um, I'd like to close the session. I thank all the speakers today. This was great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have another Kudan Open Lab seminar coming up, which is next week. And um, let me see, this is on um, um, March 7, Ariana Salazar Miranda, Urban Analytics and City Design from MIT, um, I think Sensible City Lab. Thank you very much. And so uh, applause to everybody. Thank you. Greetings to Italy. Thank you. Thank you, Max, and everybody. Thank you. Us.